Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and I'm recording this intro right after the new year. And I hope everyone had a safe and fun time on New Year's Eve. My wife and I celebrated New Year's Eve, which is also our anniversary and my birthday, by seeing Dave Chappelle. And seeing that dude, it was a total bucket list event. I look at him as the Michael Jordan of comedy. The fucking goat. Sure, there have been other amazing comics, but Chappelle is the Jordan. And when Jordan played, he left everything on the court every night. I saw him play many times, and he never disappointed. It didn't matter if he was sick, if his dad was murdered, or if he was playing for a shitty Wizards team. He always delivered the goods. Chappelle was great and really funny, but not the Michael Jordan of comedy funny. It seemed like he gave 85% that night, and I wasn't really disappointed. It was still awesome and worth every penny. And when I say every penny, it was a $160 ticket for the front row of the nosebleed level, so it was really expensive. But I'd go see him again, because it's Chappelle. It was really surreal experiencing a comedic hero, the GOAT, in person like that. But the more I think about his life and compare it to the guests that I have on the show, I realize that athletes and entertainers are one and the same. It's like Nirvana said, here we are now, entertain us. And that's what we're all after. And whether you're an athlete, a musician, a comedian, or an actor, you're all judged on your last performance. And for a skier or a snowboarder, That means taking more risks and chances and one-upping what they've done year after year. And those chances are risky, like death risky. While Chappelle can't die from performing comedy, he must really have to think about what he says and does so much more these days. Gone is all that racist stuff that he used to get away with. And since he pissed off the trans community, he was teasing the audience, almost like he was going to say fuck it and be himself again. But at the end of the night, he shied away from those type of jokes too. And I get it. It's 2022, and for better or for worse, I feel like we will never get to see the real Chappelle again, because that's how society is now. I mean, if he says what he really wants to say and is himself, there's a good chance he will offend so many people that he will be canceled, which is a death within itself. So while I'll always watch a Chappelle special and try to see him when he's in town, the days of the amazing comedy that he put out on a weekly basis with The Chappelle Show, well, those days are over. You know what other days seem to be over? What we experienced the past six months, where the virus seemed to be going away. Now we have the Omicron variant, and it's spreading like wildfire. And I sure hope I didn't get it while I was at Chappelle. I mean, I was masked up the whole time, but most weren't. And really, I could have this shit. But I'll find out in the next few days, I guess. But what is scary is that I already know like five people who have gotten this already. But while I freak out about this kind of stuff, my good friend Ryan Schmies let me know that not too many people are dying from this variant, which is good news. But so many are getting it. And like I've been saying for a couple years, I don't want this sickness because I haven't been too kind to my lungs during this life. But I'm boosted and while I've been taking chances, I'm about to reel all of that in. Actually, that's a lie. I'm planning to go to two trade shows this month. But really, that's all I need to talk about with the virus because over the past two years, you've heard me say way too much about it. So right now, it's time for me to get into part two of my podcast with Mark Abma. This week, we talk about the different aspects of the life of Abma and then finish out his incredible ski career. But before we get into it, I want to ask you to tell a friend about the podcast. I'm not an athlete or a personality with a built-in audience, so every listen I get is earned. And because I give every show 110% effort, I know your friends who like snow will love my show. So please tell them about the Powell Movement. And if you see anyone online asking for recommendations for a new podcast, please comment a link to my show. It's greatly appreciated, and it sure does help the show grow. Finally, I want to ask all of you to support the incredible brands that support my podcast. I only work with the best, and they are Stanley, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Elon Skis, Alpine Vans, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Now, it's time for part two with Mark Abma. I'll just jump in from where we left off before. Yeah. You had had a game-changing trip with Anthony Boronowski. You were living with the Whistler crew, and I think you were living with Dave Levin from Poor Boys as well. Yeah. Were you going out with Dave a lot and getting shots the whole time you guys were all living together? That first year, I was still juggling working and filming. So I, I can't say I was out there filming every single day like I would have loved to, but it was enough to get out there where I was able to 
put together a bit of a segment. And, and back then, I used to film quite a lot in the spring. So, you know, that allowed me to be able to go and film the rest of the part, just hitting park features and whatnot. Did you do any urban features as well? I did a little bit of urban features way back in the day. <laughs> Nothing really to write home about. But yeah, no, I think like way back in the day, that's kind of what we were all looking for. And I can't say we did it with any style or grace or 270s on or off. It was like just getting on straight and getting off straight was an accomplishment in itself back then. <laughs> yeah, that and not building a jump up to the feature. Oh, totally. Yeah, I remember Bornowski and JP and those guys. They were so strict about that. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> if there's a jump up to the feature, it's not cool. Totally, man. And I never got that hardcore about it. And what was the first trip that you went on that made you realize that contests aren't for you and you really want to focus on putting film parts together? Definitely Bella Coola. That's the game changer right there. Do you stop competing like hard stop almost right after that where you're like, I don't need to waste my time in the park anymore? Yeah, it just changed my whole perspective on me as a skier and what I wanted to accomplish. And yeah, it was a life changing experience. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from being the kid that dreamed about wanting to do that kind of skiing to finally realizing that this is what I'm destined to do. And this is where I thrive. Yeah, I just kind of feel like I finally tapped into my life purpose. So you found your life purpose, and at that point, you're also on K2. It starts that first year on the up-and-comers program, but I believe right after that, in the second year, you're bumped up onto the factory team really quickly, and it looks like you're going to be a huge key player with K2. And then you bounced. I believe it's your call. What was going on behind the scenes at K2 that made you leave? Or what was going on with someone else offering you stuff that made you leave? Yeah. I mean, to be quite frank, it was just a low ball offer. And I felt like I had worked incredibly hard that year. And not that I was expecting a lot, but, you know, I had worked with Poor Boys, Born Miller, and Matchstick. And I was out there hustling and had a, a good year. And so I just felt like, you know, I deserved a certain amount yeah. <laughs> just to be able to, like, keep a roof over my head. And then that's when. I had some people like Johnny from DeCesare and the Magic guys. They kind of helped line me up with Solomon. Oh, so more of that where you're getting people to self-promote for you and you don't have to do it because you're Mark Abra and you got serious talent and all these people are like, dude, we got to get Abma paid. Yeah, and I think they were stoked to continue to work with me. And of course, for the film companies to work, they need to have some budget coming in. Yeah, totally. And so, yeah, it was good for them and it was good for me. And so that year I went to X Games and I, I met up with the team manager for Solomon at the time and let him know that, hey, I'm, I'm here to, to work my ass off and I'm going to do my very best. And that's just kind of how it got started. And, you know, there was something going on with Anthony as well. I don't think he was happy with his treatment from K2 at that point, And he ended up bouncing as well. Did that treatment have anything to do with you leaving as well? Because you were so tight with Anthony and he's like done so much for you. And then you see him getting screwed over. No, you know, I didn't really know the inner workings going on with Anthony. But I do remember that summer when there was that buzz going around that there was this new ski company. Nobody was really talking about it. So it was up at High North, and all of a sudden, Anthony was on this different ski. And, you know, they had picked up Boyd Easley and Tanner and that whole crew, right? And I remember having a bit of envy because I was like, I wanted to be a part of this new program. Yep. But, yeah, they had already kind of, like, pre-selected that whole crew that made our motto what it was when it came out and obviously just made a huge splash and it's super successful. Yeah, that was an incredible thing to witness and it really did yeah. change the game right when it happened. For you though, you also had another sponsor that came through, I'm sure MSP because Helly Hansen was huge with MSP and I'm <laughs> guessing that they see you in the MSP movie and they're like, we need this kid in our program or Murray and those guys go to Helly and they're like, hey, you need Abma. Yeah, I'm not sure how that went exactly, but Gary Winberg was the guy at Helly Hansen back in the day. And yeah, I think he watched that yearbook segment and yeah, it happened pretty quickly. It was kind of quite remarkable. You know, I went from being a guy that was surviving off of change in my console one season to all of a sudden having kind of all the opportunities I could have ever dreamed of. Yeah, I mean, with the Helly one, it was a wild one because it seems like they had the best team in the business. Like, almost the best program in skiing in the beginning. Did it feel like that when you got there? 
Yeah, it was kind of the golden ticket. You know, Heli Hansen was a huge supporter of Matchstick. And I remember that first year, I was going on a heli trip in December. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for the next few years, because Matchstick and Heli Hansen worked together so closely, it was kind of like, yeah, like, where do you want to go? Let's do it. It seemed like retainers and budgets and everything was heli was through the roof. And they had a big team and everyone who wore a base layer, which is everybody who goes on the mountain, they wore Heli Hansen at that point. They totally lost that market share when they got out of the business. Yeah. But were you shocked when you see them selling a shit ton of stuff and doing really well? And then the whole program is pulled? Like, what happens with you? Yeah, that was pretty wild. They brought in a new marketing manager. And I guess he just had a, a different perspective on what he thought the Heli Hansen brand is. And so he wanted to promote the working class people, you know, like lift maintenance, ski patrol. And I don't think he was wrong by wanting to promote that, but I think there could have been a meeting in the middle where <laughs> he didn't have to ax the whole team. Yeah. But yeah, nonetheless, that kind of allowed me to move on to Solomon for their outdoor program that they were just developing at that time. Were you surprised to see Heli get back in the game a couple of years ago? I can't say I was too surprised. You know, I think they're still kind of just putting their toes in. They're not really going to the extent that they were in before. And I think that's just the nature of business. Like nobody really has the formula, right? So everybody's still trying to figure out what the best way is to spend their marketing dollars. So I think we see these full circle experiences with teams all the time. When you say that people are looking for different ways to spending their marketing dollars, at one point people were talking about more attainable skiing and kind of what you do is not attainable skiing. I mean, you go to the most remote places in the world and you do the gnarliest lines in the world, and it's something that me and many people like myself will never, ever, ever be able to do in our lives, although we aspire to watch you and get excited to see you, and it gets us stoked. But was there a shift ever to the attainable stuff that kind of not hurt you from a sponsor perspective, but maybe put the spotlight less on you because they wanted to get the masses not thinking gnarly and thinking everyday skier? Yeah, you know, I think I was pretty lucky, actually. When I was working with Solomon, we were doing Free Ski TV. And Douglas did a really great job of creating these attainable film pieces. Yeah, he does. And so although I was filming with Matchstick, doing all that kind of stuff, at the same time, we were still going on these really great cultural experiences. So I think that kind of gave me a bit of a balance that way. And, and I learned a lot from working with Douglas. Because now that I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm definitely trying to apply that formula and methodology. So. For example, just skiing with Hoji and Rubens, you know, we're going out there and we're really trying to encompass and showcase our friendship and camaraderie while we're out there. And it's not necessarily about skiing enough. You know, it's about the high fives and the hugs. And that's a weird one because you and Rubens, with tons of personality, I know Hoji. I don't know him well because he's always super quiet and it's got to be hard <laughs> to showcase his personality when you've got a super quiet dude. Yeah, totally. He can be super quiet and reserved, but at the same time, he can be the absolute life of the party. He's got the most amazing sense of humor. And when he starts chiming, he'll steal the show and he'll just have joke after joke after joke. It's quite remarkable, actually. And that's something that doesn't always get shown on film because it's hard to capture those moments. But you will see his humor come through sometimes in film segments. And yeah, I think for people that know him, know him as that but he's also the quirky engineer guy yeah i mean people want to show him as the boot nerd you know that's like the story around him is like hey here's the boot nerd that's going to tech out on everything then show you how rad a skier he is yeah and then as soon as people go on one trip with him they're like oh all right this is who hoji really is okay yeah so two different people there and when we get back into sponsorship, who are the major brands that support you during the peak of your career? And then we'll talk about the brands that support you now. But when you were making the most money ever, who was paying you? Yeah, that was the, the Solomon, Heli Hansen era. Okay. And are you able to make, you know, I mean, I'm guessing six figures is in your wheelhouse, but is it like more than just low six figures? It was like the low to medium. I never got into seven. That would have been awesome. <laughs> that would have been insane. But low to medium is still better than most people that I talk to because most people just are in the low. They're like, oh, yeah, I just barely hit 100 grand. So you had Heli Hansen, you had Solomon, you had who else paying you back then? Smith and DeKine. Oh, and you were doing that of four sponsors. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. 
And then when you look at your sponsorship list this year, right now, what does it look like? Yeah, so I've got Black Rose being my mainstay right now and kind of the flagship. And then I guess very new news, the contract will be signed by the time this podcast comes up, but I'm going to be on Dynafit Boots and Bindings, which I'm super excited about. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks so much. Going back to Hoji again, he's designed this amazing walk mechanism in their boots, and I've been totally blown away. It feels like I'm wearing a hiking boot when I'm walking around town, or ski touring for that matter. So you're going to be getting out there further than ever thanks to Hoji and this new sponsorship. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally, man. And then I'm uh, re-signing with Smith as well. That's been going on for 20 years? Yeah, a super long time. And it's kind of nice I'm signing with everybody for three years. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because do you ever get stuck in the mentality or do your sponsors ever get stuck in the mentality of like they only want to give you one-year deals and is that frustrating? No, I, I really try to steer clear of one year because it goes so quickly and negotiating always takes, I'd say, a few to six months. So we just be negotiating the whole time. So it's nice for both parties, I think, just to be able to have and that security and stability so that you can really plan for the future. And in talking about planning for the future, I know you're on Solomon for a long time. You've switched over to Black Crows. What happened with Solomon? Like, why the breakup? Was it just time spent and they were, they were done with you and they wanted to move in a different direction? You know what? It was kind of an interesting time. They had a massive team. And I remember one year, Under Armour approached me. So I got an offer from them. And then I went to Solomon. I was like, hey, what do you think about me on the, the Under Armour Outwear program? And at first, they seemed interested in it because there, there was an opportunity for a lot of cross promotion. Yeah, as long as they're keeping the Solomon logos in there, that you're going to get double exposure. Yeah, because Under Armour was then title sponsor of Matchstick. Oh, nice. So it kind of keeps me in the, the Matchstick program and be able to continue to get exposure, which is obviously still great for Solomon's skis, boots, and bindings. And so. We're kind of moving forward with creating that deal. And then kind of in the, the final hour, Solomon said no and said they want to do head to toe. And I felt like at that time, that head to toe deal was, it was a pay cut. So I don't know. I just felt like they kind of had me by the balls, you know, and it just wasn't a good feeling. Yeah. So it was kind of around that same time that Chris Booth was working at Black Crows. Yep. And so we just got on the horn with Boothie and he made it happen for me. And it was super awesome. And so I kind of, yeah, I went from being on the full Salmon program to all of a sudden being on Black Rose and Under Armour and then Del Bello and Marker picked me up. So all of a sudden I had like more of a, a diverse package, which felt really good. Yeah. And Under Armour fits all that bodybuilding stuff that you do. So you've got all the <laughs> muscle clothes. So you're good there. <laughs> And one cool thing about you is how smart you've been with your money. And I'm going to guess that when you live like you were living in the beginning, which is almost as dirtbag as Charlie Ager, but not as dirtbag, but pretty damn close. When money comes your way, I'm guessing you really appreciate it and you want to make it last. And was that the thought process when you bought your place in Squamish in 2006? Like, I'm going to buy a place, pay it off, and then I can be in the Whistler area forever? Yeah, that was definitely the goal. I knew that as soon as I had any bit of money, I was going to buy myself a place to live in. Not that I could pay it off. That would have been awesome. But nonetheless, it got me into the market early, Yep, which is obviously super helpful. And I was always <laughs> that person where like, whatever town I went to, wherever it was in the world, you know, I was always really interested in the real estate market. You know, I would always walk by real estate offices and I would just browse and kind of imagine myself living in that town, whether it was Japan or anywhere in Europe. Huh. Yeah. It's interesting now that I'm like so involved with real estate now. So like after Squamish, I just, you know, ended up moving to Pemberton, but hanging on to the Squamish place. And that's kind of what's allowed me to be able to, to make some moves since then. So you still have that Squamish place. Did you rent it out for the Olympics? I did rent that place out for a number of years. And then I eventually sold it and kind of traded it dollar for dollar and mr damien cromwell i'm not sure if you remember him yeah yeah he was my realtor and he uh, totally made it happen which is awesome it's so rad working with a buddy that i skied with for so many years but anyhow i traded the or kind of sold one and got into this commercial building in downtown squamish that had a couple commercial spaces and a couple residential spaces 
and it had a, a parking lot on the back. So I ended up partnering with a friend of mine, and then we ended up developing that parking lot and building another commercial unit and two more residential spaces. It's like a five-story townhome-ish style building. Yeah, we just built it as efficient and long-lasting as possible. Yeah, it's kind of my learning experience in getting into doing some real estate development. Now it's time for a sponsor break, and I'm going to start things out with the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing my favorite Northwest beer since 2006, and since they started brewing their beer, they've been supporting the sports we love. And if you aren't sure about what they have done in action sports, well, I'll tell you. They're the first beer brand to produce their own ski and snowboard movie. They support a team of A-list athletes. They have signature beers that donate to causes like Protect Our Winners. And they are part of the most important events and properties in action sports. If all of that isn't enough, the people that work at Ten Barrel, they're all skiers, snowboarders, and bikers. And they love to drink beer outside and want you to love drinking beer outside too. So the next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of Ten Barrel. And if you can find a legal place to drink it outside, please do it. It tastes that much better out in the wild. And if you want to find out more about the beers, the pubs, and the events, head on over to TenBarrel.com. My next sponsor is Stanley, an iconic Seattle brand that has been ahead of the curve since 1913. While we all know Stanley for creating the iconic green bottle that kept our grandparents' coffee hot all day long, they still do that, and a lot more these days. And Stanley has always been the right choice when it comes to the planet. Seriously, if you are still using single-use plastics for your beverages, it's time to make a change for the better, for the environment. And I'm making it easier than ever to do so. I'm going to save you 30% on all products from Stanley. That's the best deal you're going to find anywhere on any Stanley products. Here's what you need to do to get that 30% off. Head on over to Stanley1913.com, buy some stuff, and I highly recommend a water bottle and a set of pint glasses. You can thank me later. And when you check out, enter the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word, and that will save you 30%. Spend $75 or more, and the good folks at Stanley are going to send you a custom Powell Movement beanie. My final sponsor this round is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Peter Glenn has been getting people out there for over 60 years. And whether you're going on vacation or a weekend warrior or ski or ride every day, Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the deals, a knowledgeable staff, a price matching policy, and free shipping on orders of $49 or more. If you're listening to this podcast and need gear, please do me a favor and head on over to peterglenn.com. They have all the deals, and by buying from them, you are supporting the show and keeping it going. So please check out peterglenn.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. You bought that property in Squamish, as you said, and that's the development in itself for you because it's one of those places that you bought because it was on a river, but really it was like a blank canvas for you. And when I look at you as a person, it's like you're so many different parts, and you're part farm boy, and you're part athlete, and you're part businessman, but you're also part artist, and that comes out in your mm -hmm. skiing a lot. But it comes out more so in like your Hobbit-like property. And can you tell us what you've built on this property? Yeah, totally. That is definitely where I'm the most happiest is when I'm creating with those kind of mediums. But it's all kind of centered around kind of working with my hands, but also creating this space that's good for my overall well-being. And so like the front yard was just a lawn. And so I ripped up the grass and put in a garden and a greenhouse there. And then you walk around the side of the house and I built a little Japanese garden with a pond and planted some fruit trees there. And then you walk around the side and that's where you enter the spa zone. And so the spa zone was inspired by reading an article on hydrotherapy. And I just read on all the benefits that comes along with doing this hot, cold immersion. And right away, I was like, man, I got to create this for myself. Like the Laird Hamilton lifestyle? Yeah, no doubt. You know, I guess it was more inspired by Wim Hof, the Iceman, as you, you've probably heard of him. Yes, I have. Yeah. So anyhow, I built a sauna and then I built a, a cold pool and an outdoor shower in that area. And then I built a chicken coop. And then I built a, like a beehive zone. And then I built a tree house in the property. So it's kind of this <laughs> eclectic zone of all these little passion projects. For most of these builds, they're all built with like scrap wood from the wood mills that are around our area here. So not 100 um, Home Depot trips. You're just going and finding reclaimed stuff. Yeah, exactly, man. So there's been like hundreds of sweat equity hours in it, but 
very little cost in the building materials. And I really started falling in love with using stone after spending all this time in Europe. I was like, these streets and buildings are lasting for hundreds of years. Like, why aren't we doing that back home? So that's when I just started loading up the back of the truck with stone and then coming back. And Hoji there again, he's an incredible stonemason. And so he kind of taught me the ways and showed me how to start stacking rock. And so my house definitely has that theme all around it. Well, I was at Kai Peterson's interviewing him, and we were sitting outside on his porch looking at your house. And when I say hobbit-like, I mean, it is kind of a hobbit-like. You can tell that it wasn't the Home Depot build. It is totally organic, (laughs) and it looks so cool, and it's a really unique thing. So that's pretty cool. But another thing that you've been building is something with your buddy Chris Turpin. And like two summers ago, I was looking on the internet, or I was scrolling through Instagram, and it seemed like every day I'd see you and Chris Turpin on a ferry moving stuff from one place to another (laughs) and you're building on this island and you're going to have your geodome and it's going to be like a crazy little property. What do you guys actually have there? Yeah. So right now we have the geodesic dome and we built a yurt there as well. And this past fall, I just planted an apple orchard over there. And then we, we had a well on the property, but the well is near to the bottom of the property. So anyhow, we hooked up a solar water pump that pumps the water all the way to the top of the property. And at the top, we've got a a 6,000 liter water cistern. And then from that water cistern, it's all gravity fed back down to the yurt and the dome. And then in addition to that, we're gonna be using water that comes from a creek to produce power. And we've got solar power up there. And then I guess, you know, spa life is a big part of Chris's life as well, or bathing is more a big part of Chris's life. So that was actually probably the first thing that we did. and. He found a, a clawfoot tub on Craigslist, so I ripped down the city and grabbed it. And yeah, we put it on the beach right away. And so you just bucket in a bunch of water from the ocean and then light a fire underneath of it and just kick back and relax and enjoy the view. So he's a big fan of bathing. Does he take a lot of baths? Oh, he's super into bathing. It's hilarious. I don't, I'm not sure how many days a week, but it's quite a lot. And he'll get himself fully set up. Like candles and drinks? Oh, candles. Yeah, he'll put cedar branches in there. And then he'll quite often bring his laptop and watch a movie and he'll spend a couple hours. <laughs> That's so weird because you're getting in this tub as well. And you know, if he's spending a couple hours in the tub, he's probably jerked off in it before. And then you're getting in the tub at some point. So it's super weird. <laughs> that is kind of weird. I never really thought about that. But yeah, <laughs> high <a> probability. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something that I've heard of called tub shrimp. I don't know if you've heard of them, but It is the remains that stick to the bottom and kind of stand up, and they're called tub shrimp. I heard about them in another podcast, and you may have laid in Chris Turpin's tub shrimp, which is absolutely disgusting. That sounds horrible, but... (laughs) But at least you can't smell it. I think the tub's hot enough, because you're literally, you have a fire underneath of it that's probably burning any tub shrimp that could exist in there. Okay, so you can't get pregnant, at least. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah you actually have to sit on a little piece of cedar underneath your butt otherwise you will li- you'll burn your ass oh wow yeah so you're keeping the fire going when you're in this bath it's hilarious but the cast iron holds the heat so well that it stays hot for quite a long time it's a really nice organic experience you know it's just like it's pretty raw and it works incredibly well that bathtub will heat up in 45 minutes well wow. Yeah. And the whole property looks amazing. I mean, it looks like a a nice escape for the summertime for you guys. Yeah, it's great, man. And actually, you know, we're there like three seasons of the year. And for us, it's kind of an opportunity for us to learn how to build in more of a a rougher typology. Like we're we're just getting beech wood and figuring out how to notch it with a chainsaw and then just lag bolt them together. And so we've built a couple structures that way. And we just want to learn how to live off the land. You know, Turpin's always really been into fishing and hunting. But now we're, yeah, just learning the ways of catching crabs and prawns and learning what fish we can catch from being near to to the dock there. And there's lots of deer on the island and we're allowed to hunt for those deer. And now, you know, with getting the apple orchard in there and I spent, I don't know, four or five days kind of getting our garden area prepped. So next year we'll get a, a bunch of root vegetables in there and our goal is to be able to create a place where we can just fully self-sustain ourselves, you know, create our own power, our own food. Yeah. And just, I think it's becoming just a lost art, you know, just learning how to survive. 
Oh, it totally is. I mean, yeah. Why would you? We have the internet now. Why would you need to learn how to survive? <laughs> it totally, man. It's so easy to order everything. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Amazon delivers to your your island, but maybe they will Definitely one day not. with drones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's pretty fun because you can't just go to the hardware store, the lumber yard. You have to really be resourceful with what you have and make do with what you have, and it's a really fun and creative experience and. It's still kind of the land of the lawless over there. And so we can kind of build and create what we want. I don't know. That's one of the funnest things for me to do is to be able to do what I want when I want. You know, as long as you're being respectful to the land and to your neighbors, then, you know, have at her. No, it sounds awesome. And in thinking of other investments, you know, we've talked about a bunch of them that you have on the business side of Abma. Are there other investments that you have that are worth talking about? Yeah. So that project that my partner and I built downtown Squamish, we, we just sold that this past summer. And then we, we bought some land in Tofino. And so now we're doing a multifamily project over there. Oh, nice. Yeah. So right now it's this crazy steep lot. <laughs> it's pretty wild, man. And there's this incredible cabin at the top that's non-conforming, doesn't have any building permits, but it was built by this legendary surf shaper and musician. And it's just all post and beam cedar. There's not one piece of drywall in there. So there's no power to the cabin, no water. So it just relies on solar, rainwater, and it's got a compost into it. So I spent a good chunk of time out there this summer, just kind of getting that cabin up and running. And then we're currently going through a rezoning phase and then designing the project, which will be 16 homes that are kind of 1,200 to 1,500 square feet. So kind of medium sized. 16 homes? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So you are going to be set for life by the time you get this development done, as long as the market stays good and everything, then it's going to stay <laughs> yeah, good. Totally. You're going to be in a good position to be set because 16 homes on Tofino, they're going to sell for a pretty penny, I would think. And there's going to be a, a good return for you. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's a stepping stone. And I think what's really unique about this project is we're creating a parking area down at the bottom. And because you can't drive to the top of this lot, we can't have a road going up. So we're using an electric funicular to get people up to their homes. I don't even know what a funicular is. Yeah, so it's a, a little trolley that sits on rails. <laughs> yeah, and I'll send you an image later, but it's definitely going to be the first of its kind for North America. <laughs> so you don't make your life easy, man. <laughs> No, definitely not, man. <laughs> yeah, people look at this and they're like, oh, I love the idea, but is this safe? And like, how do you get firefighters up there? And there's like all these technicalities that comes along with life safety and whatnot. But, you know, we're hoping that if we can make this work, that we can find other challenging lots that nobody else wants and do something unique with it. And I think it creates a really special experience when you are on a hill because it doesn't feel like you're surrounded by your neighbors. Yeah, true. And this property is incredible. It's got like thousand year old cedar trees on it. And so we're leaving obviously these old growth standing and so we're kind of building with the topography and building around the beautiful trees that exist on the land there. Nice, nice. Well, we've hit the business front of you. We've hit the artistic front a little bit of you, but I also want to talk about the hippie front. I think that's something that makes you different than a lot of the rest of the people or a lot of the rest of the athletes that we talk about because you are way ahead of the curve on things when it comes to climate change, I feel like. Like your biodiesel vehicle that you did in what, like 2005, 2006 to raise awareness for climate change and actually just lower your carbon footprint. How does that idea come into your head? Yeah, it's hard to say what the initial spark was. You know, my dad, he's always been pretty into finding efficiencies he designed greenhouses. So it's all about being super efficient with heating. Yep. And so I think that's always kind of been instilled in me. But as far as the veggie oil thing goes, I met a couple of people along the way that were doing that. Like Jonathan Moore, the pro snowboarder, you know, he drove to Alaska and back on, on veggie oil, which definitely inspired me to eventually do that. And then you have Willie Nelson, another person, he drove his tour bus around in veggie oil. And then I met a couple of people in Squamish that were doing it. And I was like, this sounds so rad. I mean, why wouldn't a guy? So I, I got myself a diesel truck. And initially I was doing biodiesel and, you know, it was so rad. The guys from the public works, they were managing the Heli Hansen team. They built this biodiesel generator or system for myself so I could make my own biofuel. And so I did that for a year, but I realized it was quite complicated. It was a pretty technical process. And then after speaking with people who are doing just veggie oil, I was like, well, this, this is way simpler. I can't 
put the wrong kind of fuel into my truck and potentially do any damage. Right. Yeah. So I kind of just made a bit of a switch. So I did a conversion kit onto my truck and got a centrifuge from my garage. And yeah, it just started heading up a bunch of different restaurants and just bringing all the oil back to my garage, cleaning it. And it was the best feeling ever, man. When you flick the switch from diesel to veg oil, it just it warmed my heart and made me feel so good. And it smelled good. Well, that's one thing I was going to ask. Yeah. Because you can't smell. So yeah. <laughs> do other people think it smelled good or was it They just... do. They love it, man. But do you smell like french fries everywhere you go? Or deep fried chicken or tempura, anything that was in that deep fried. <laughs> it's hilarious, man. Like that Alaska trip, I ended up picking up oil from this guy that was collecting from all the Kentucky Fried Chickens in Anchorage. So I smell like KFC the whole way home. It's hilarious. <laughs> and I mean, you can't smell. So I guess that's a good thing for you because I mean, I can see it being a novelty for someone when they get in your truck. Like, oh man, it smells like McDonald's French fries. But then when you smell like McDonald's French fries for months on end, that's got to be interesting. Oh yeah. But does it save a lot of money at the end of the day? It really does. Yeah. I mean, it's free fuel. Yeah. And then your carbon footprint is huge as it is between planes, helicopters, snowmobiles. So do you look at it as a good way to offset how you live as well? You know, it's it's an effort. You know, the largest component of my carbon footprint back in the day was definitely flying on planes. Yeah. Even when I was doing a lot of heli skiing, hopping on a plane was four or five times that of my helicopter time. So, yeah, by doing that with my truck, it helped. And I think that's what kind of really got my head into creating a more sustainable place to live in as well, because that's actually a pretty big component to our carbon footprint. And so that's when I started learning more about renewable energies. And I guess it's taken a long while to kind of get to a place where I can really start learning more about that. But that's kind of what Concept Neverland is now with Chris and I, you know, it's like really trying to understand the feasibility of living with solar or with micro hydro and trying to make that work with having the modern appliances like a fridge, for example, that we like to use, you know, because all those things, they, they take a lot. Yeah. Is it really messy, though, when you're doing a biodiesel or you're doing vegetable oil? Oh, my gosh. I've had some absolutely horrendous oil spills in my garage. But <laughs> 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 I've had a couple moments where, you know, I'm packing, I'm trying to get ready for a trip and I'm fueling up my truck where I'm cleaning oil and I'll walk into my garage and whatever might have happened, you know, like something started overflowing and I'll have a half inch of veggie oil throughout my whole garage. Oh, Jesus. It's the worst, man. Or while I'm fueling my truck, you know, I'm like doing laundry and getting distracted. And I come back out to check on to see if the, the truck is filled up yet. And it's overflowing out of my truck and flowing down my driveway. So my driveway was for quite a while, like this sticky, nasty veggie oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was always kind of covering up my mess it sucked but i think it was a, a small price to pay for the learning that came from that whole experience yeah and you, you know that got you so much exposure as well that really wasn't around your skiing it was just around your footprint i mm -hmm. feel like everyone reported on it so that's more exposure for mark and that's good for you and your sponsors and everything else but getting yeah. away from the hippie part of you now there's a new age healer part of you that's different about you and how you treat your body because I look at most athletes, especially the ones that you came up skiing with, and they didn't start focusing on yoga or anything with their bodies until they were 30 or 40, it seems like. But you've been into that stuff since you were like a young kid almost. Like, how do you find a path to that stuff so young? You know what? It was actually through High North that I first tried yoga. So you're like 22. Yeah, early 20s, probably like 20, 21. And there was a guy named Dave Smith, and he was into yoga way back in the day. And so... <laughs> tall Dave? Yeah, Tall Dave, exactly, man. He's like a Nat Geo photographer now, I think. Yeah, I know. It's so awesome. Yeah, what I'm a so great guy. That guy. Yeah. So he dragged a bunch of us out to Function Junction to this Bikram's yoga studio. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, man, I was not prepared for that. Like, I nearly fainted in there. <laughs> you know, and not that I can say I really enjoyed that experience right off the bat, but it just opened my eyes to it, you know, just kind of planted the seed. And then a couple of years later, I tried yoga again while I was training on the BC team. And I remember that experience. I walked out of the, the yoga studio and I felt like I was walking on air. And I was like, wow, that's something I really need because I was training so much, you know, it was becoming just like this little ball of muscle and it's just not balanced. 
yeah, it's great to be strong, but you can still get injured by muscles tearing and whatnot. And so although I was stretching, it really wasn't enough to keep up with all the training that we were doing. And with yoga, you're doing it for a full hour and then you're learning how to breathe properly. And that's just a huge component. And then depending on the yoga teacher, there could be like a meditation portion to that, you know, and just learning how to calm your mind. And so, yeah, that's kind of got my mind moving in that direction where, you know, it just made me realize I need more balance in my life. And then I've heard that you've also went to some transformative tantric workshop. I don't even know what tantric is. I thought it was like something <laughs> sexual or something like a 90s alt band or something like that. But what's that workshop all about? It was breath work and some really deep breathing that took me to a place that was beyond that of any psychedelic experience I'd had. Really? Sorry? Really? Like oh, yeah. Like nearly out of your body, full. So it was something that it's pretty hard to explain, but both physically, mentally, spiritually, it yeah, it just blew my mind with the visuals that came along with it and the body experience that came along with it. And so that's when I really started understanding the power of breath and how underutilized it is. You know, we just breathe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We don't even have to think about it. And more often than not, I don't think about it, but I really try to bring myself back to remembering to breathe because they say that just with six deep breaths, you can calm your nervous system, which I think these days is so key because we do have a lot of stress in our lives. And you have a lot of like situations where you put in like when you get towed in on a heli and you have to yeah. jump out of the heli and you're looking at the line and you're scared shitless. So I don't even know if you get scared shitless. Oh, yeah, I do for sure. And is that when you use those breathing techniques? Absolutely, man. Yeah, that's like one of the best things I can do for myself when I'm out there. Because I always have so much time. You're just standing up there, just waiting, waiting, waiting. And you could throw yourself into a bit of a head spin by overcomplicating your situation. And so, yeah, I just take time to breathe. And then I just review my line and where I'm going to make every turn. And I just really try to keep it simple like that and just stay calm. And like right before I drop in, you know, I just take like one big breath. And I feel like that really helps get me into that that flow state. Now it's time for my second sponsor break, and I'm going to start things out with Elon Skis. I've been skiing my Ripstick 96 Black Editions a ton lately, and man, those things are so quick edge to edge. And while 96 is narrower than anything I've skied in a while, I totally back them on the not-so-deep days, and on hard snow, they make you ski like a rock star. When my kid told me something looked different about my skiing, I knew it was more about the skis than it was me. And if you want to go wider and get out there more, Elon and Glenn Plake have the Ripstick 106 Tour. Finally, a Plake Pro model that has all the personality of a Ripstick at a fraction of the weight. Glenn spent eight months designing and testing these to ensure they deliver the perfect blend of uphill efficiency and downhill performance. Head on over to elonskis.com to learn more about the design process directly from Glenn. And last but definitely not least is Alpine Vans. Alpine Vans is your one-stop shop for your dream adventure mobile. If you haven't checked out the Cody Townsend van video on their homepage, watch it, and you're going to see why Alpine Vans are leaps and bounds ahead of the competition, which is why they only have two vans left to build out this season, and they have big, big plans for next year. So if you want to get one of those two vans that they have left, well, head over to alpinevans.com and fill out their thoughtful quote builder and questionnaire. Well, I can't guarantee you'll get one of the last two practical, durable, easy-to-use vans that they have in stock. It's worth a try. And if you don't get one, I recommend holding out for next fall. And that's all I can really say because Alpine Vans has big plans, but they won't let me tell you about them until the fall. So check out Alpine Vans, see what they're able to do, and hold tight until you can get your hands on one of those vehicles. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Is there anything else that I'm missing on what you do that helps you get into the zone or that's not really looked at as normal in terms of training for an athlete? Because the tantric workshop and some of the stuff, while it is looked at as normal, it took a while for a lot of people to accept it or for it to become the norm. Is there anything else that you were kind of an early adopter of that other people are doing now? Well, I would say I was one of the earlier people to start getting into the, the hydrotherapy thing. Yep. And like really appreciating the sauna experience. That's been a huge component of my life and something that I, I really, really appreciate. It's got so many physical benefits, you know, just from like opening up your capillaries and moving blood and getting rid of lactic acid. But at the same time, when I'm sitting in the sauna, I don't have my phone with me. And so I'm able to there again, just kind of like take some time to relax and shut my brain off for a little bit. 
Yeah. And then I'd still do my very best to keep my body in shape. So and training is still a pretty big component of my life. And then biking has been huge for me as well, just keeping my cardio and overall fitness up. And at the same time, it's just like, a, it's a really fun way to train. It does nothing for your ski legs, though. I just figured that out yesterday when I went oh skiing. Oh my gosh, I know. There's no, I don't know what you can do for your ski legs, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've done some lactic acid training that seems to help a little bit, but at the end of the day, to do a long top to bottom, you just got to do it, man. <laughs> yeah, do it over and over, and then eventually totally. it'll be strong. Yeah. I'm sure you look at all these things as why your career has been so long is that you've done a lot of things for your body and you put yourself in a position to have a long career. And I've gotten totally way off topic in the podcast because when we were talking about skiing in the last podcast, we ended with the yearbook and that being a huge year, but we didn't talk about the powder awards. And for a dude like yourself, who's never really won anything, when you find out that you're nominated for a powder award, your second year of being like a big time pro skier. Is it hard to comprehend that you're being talked about in the same sentence as all your ski heroes and then that happens so quickly for you? Yeah, I couldn't really comprehend it. Is it uncomfortable? It wasn't uncomfortable, but I just, I don't know. I still couldn't really put myself in the same category as people like McConkie or Seth or there's so many amazing and respected skiers out there, right? Yeah. I was still just me and still like that small kid from Hemlock. And I didn't really know how to process it. I just processed it. And I was like, all right, I'm moving on. And it's creating these opportunities now. Does Powder let you know that you won an award beforehand or they strongly suggest that you attend the event? How does that work? Do you even remember? It was a strong suggestion. And so, you, yeah, I couldn't really prepare for it. And, you know, it's kind of a bittersweet, you know, because there's so many other amazing skiers around you that are so deserving of it as well. Like I remember Bushy was next to me and both him and I had these insanely good seasons and he could have just as well have won it. And every year there's always, you know, a crew of oh, five or 10 guys that could be winning that award. So it's just kind of a humbling experience. And when you win that award, I would think it's like a dream. Like everything in your life that you've ever wanted has happened pretty much at this point. Is that weird? Like yeah. achieving your goals at 24? Yeah, it is super weird because uh, I remember, <laughs> you know, not to throw Shannon Shad under the bus at all, but I remember I was still on K2 and I was asking him about Solomon because I was trying to like, you know, try to find a different ski sponsor. And he's like, ah, oh, they probably wouldn't sponsor you because you're too old. So it was kind of interesting, you know, because it, it wasn't quick and easy for me. You know, there's some people that became pro skiers when they're in their teenage years. Yeah, you have to work your ass off, man. Yeah. And I was kind of a late bloomer compared to a lot of the people out there, you know? So even after I quit mogul skiing, I was living on a couch and hitting up these little comps, but definitely not really moving in the direction of becoming a pro skier. You know, it was like, I was judging WSI before I was competing in it, you know? Yeah. When it all happened, it just happened so quickly. Yeah. It, it was pretty hard to really process it. But it's not like you relax at all. You win that award. And then over the next two years, it's like you put out six video parts in two years, which is crazy. It's like three parts a year. And how many days do you have to go out shooting to put out three parts a year? Because I would think it's just insane with the travel and all the time you're putting on the snow. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say how many days, but it was pretty much any time there was any opportunity, then we were out there and I was definitely chasing my tail, flying around the world, trying to find the next best zone and the best snow and whatnot, which is super fun but not always that productive. <laughs> no, no, especially if you don't have the right forecast. Yeah, it's just kind of that chipping away process, you know, and eventually it kind of amounts to five minutes of skiing. <laughs> I know, it's so crazy. You work so hard so for that fun. five minutes of skiing. Oh my goodness, yeah. And that's what I really appreciated about Free Ski TV because we could go there for a week or 10 days and it didn't have to be crazy good skiing. There's always so much more of a story to tell. Yeah, when you're not trying to be just gnarly. Yeah, and it made a lot more fun for me. Yeah, I can imagine that it's kind of got to just fry your nerves at some point, especially in the years that you're going and filming for three parts. When you're going on trips and you're expected to one up what you did yesterday every single day, it's got to kind of just burn you out a little bit. Like at some point when you put yourself in those risky situations day after day after day after day after day, do you ever kind of be like, hey, I can't do this as much anymore and I need to scale it back. And is that why you go to just do a couple sections a year after that? Yeah, you know, I didn't understand what adrenal fatigue was back in the day. And so I'd get to the end of the winter and all of a sudden I was left exhausted. 
and I couldn't really think that clearly. Yeah, I was just kind of left in a bit of a daze for two to four weeks after the winter. So eventually I started learning what adrenal fatigue was and almost being ready for it to a certain extent. So when it happened, I was able to just kind of settle into that experience and just rest a little bit and give myself some time to replenish. And back then I was, I was skiing all months of the year and I loved it. But at the same time, yeah, it definitely resulted in a bit of just getting tired and getting burnt out through that adrenal fatigue. Most of us don't know what adrenal fatigue is. I mean, we can imagine what it is, but most of us don't get yeah, that much totally. adrenaline through life. Yeah, exactly. We've got these adrenal glands that allow us to be able to kick ass on those days when we need to. But if you're kicking ass for too many days in a row, then eventually your adrenal glands, your adrenals, they get, they get fully drained and then you're left with no energy. So that's when I started discovering this, uh, this whole balance concept and taking some time off in the summertime and doing other things like biking and surfing and kiteboarding and just finding other passions in life that weren't as intense. So that when winter came back around, I was fully fired up and feeling like a 14-year-old kid again. Yeah, I guess that's what you need. You need that reset of feeling a 14-year-old kid every year to be able to do what you're doing for a long body of a career. I could go on on and on about video projects, but I'm not going to. I mean, we could say, you know, you won another powder award for push a couple years later. But the video part I want to talk about is one that you did for the masquerade. And this was an avant-garde cinematic take of whatever the hell goes through Pettit's demented mind. How do you become <laughs> a part of that project? Yeah, that year I was filmed with Matchstick, but I don't know what happened exactly, but I just wasn't feeling like I was being that productive with my time. And it was January and I think there was good skiing and I wasn't filming as much as I wanted to be or I felt like I needed to be. And so I bumped into Pettit one day and I just kind of asked him, I was like, hey, like, what's your program? Do you got any room for you? I'm kind of feeling like I've, I've got extra time in my winter here. And he was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Which was so rad because, you know, I'd seen him grow up from being just a Grom and then going on his first Alaska trip with him and seeing him tap into his superpowers and him not wasting any time and all of a sudden spearheading this film project and working with Lee Powis, who, you know, really complimented Sean's creativeness. So it was cool because that year I got to spend a lot of time with Pettit and Perman. And they really, they just wanted you to be you as far as doing the kind of skiing that you want to do. But then everywhere else, it didn't seem like you were you. There were guns, there was violence, there were all things oh, that yeah. Canadians shake their heads <laughs> at Americans for. You were acting, you were doing all kinds of shit. I can imagine that the public and your sponsors and your family, when they saw it, they're like, Mark, what the fuck did I just watch? Did you feel like that when you saw that movie? Oh, yeah, totally. There were so many people that didn't know what to make of it. And that was Lee Powis's brainchild there. That was him stepping into his real creative self, which is why he's crushing it now, because he's doing something totally different. He works with low light, and it's kind of got this darker feel to it. But I remember Kale Meyer from Smith Optics, he was like, that was the coolest project I've ever seen, or the coolest ski movie I've ever seen. So although there was a lot of people that didn't know what to make of it, and there was some people that really appreciated the artistic nature of that film. I thought it was super neat. It just seemed weird knowing that the Canadians produced it and like gun, like the whole gun thing. I just didn't even get it, really. But <laughs> I thought it was cool. It was well done. It was just at the end of the day, it was weird. I mean, I think K2 helped pay for it. So we were definitely on board for it. But yeah, it was just a strange one for me. It was super strange. I just rolled with it. And I think that's a lot of what I do within working with different filmers and different film companies. Because you don't have that control, right? You're just the talent for them? Yeah, you know, with Matchstick, we'll all collaborate on trips that we're doing or titles for the film. But Gaffney, at the end of the day, has full creative control, you know, and he's the guy that makes Matchstick what it is. And Throughout the year, I'm working with different filmers and everybody's got their own perspective of what kind of angle or what speed they want to shoot that shot at. And because we're filled with a bunch of creatives, I want everybody to be able to express their creative nature to their fullest. And so whatever project I hop into, I just kind of become a bit of a chameleon and just kind of work with whatever vision they have. And then I just kind of do my role within their vision. And I think that's what it makes it fun because 
I really love working with a bunch of different people because I'm learning so much from these different people every time. Well, when you're just doing your part and you're not really involved in the how it's going to look and feel, has there ever been a part that comes out that you're bummed on? Where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I look like that. Um, so <laughs> I remember back in the day, there was one part that I wasn't super stoked on and it was with Poor Boys and they edited my segment with was it Two of Hearts or something. <laughs> Oh, the song? <laughs> the song, man. It was so brutal. And I think that's ultimately where I have the toughest time sometimes is with music selection. And I totally get it because music can be expensive. Yeah, it can be really expensive. Yeah. And so I always try to put my two cents into using music that I feel represents me. But sometimes that just doesn't work out and it comes out and it's with a song that I really don't like. And so that's kind of just like nails on a chalkboard for me sometimes. But I get it. <laughs> I mean, that ruins the whole part for you then. If it's nails on a chalkboard and it's your part, that's got to be just so such a bummer. Yeah, totally. You just worked so hard on it. And that's why so often or for so many years, I would head down to Tahoe and I would be a part of that editing process with Gaffney. And that was, you know, just kind of necessary because I just spent five months, let's say, filming a part. So I felt like it was pretty essential to go down there and just be a part of the few days of editing just to ensure that I felt like I was being represented in a way that was good for me and good for my sponsors. Yeah, you got to cover your bases there and make sure that you feel confident and good about yourself at the end of the day. So that yeah. helps you do it. I was going to jump into injuries. I'm just looking at time. And so I am going to yep. jump into injuries just a little bit. But yep. I think you did back to back knees in like 2010, 2011. That's the common ski injury. We're not going to talk about it. Your knees are better now. But the one thing I think about with injuries with you that you have that most other people don't have is a lot of stitches and most of your stitches come to your face <laughs> like yeah did you drill your face once yeah i've had a few pretty full-on face experiences and one was skiing in mammoth way back in the day with cr and pep and we were skiing in this permanent closure area and i dropped in and straight line this little chute and it was early season and i hit a rock underneath of the snow so that rock just pitched me forward and threw me into the side of the chute. And I, yeah, just hit that wall straight to my face Ugh. and knocked me out. And it was a mandatory exit error. And I came through and I was a mess. I had blood all over my face and I yelled for help right away. And Pep was the first guy on scene. <laughs> and you know, you're, you're messed up when you see the expression on your buddy's face. Yeah. But nonetheless, he was super calm, cool, collected as he is. And he took his shirt off and tied it around my head. And we were in a permanent closure area. So it was like no time for it because I'd lost one of my skis. So I ended up skiing out of one ski, blood all over my face and his shirt tied around my head. And they brought me straight to the hospital. And because it was so bad, they ended up, I forget where they took me. It was like a town near Reno, Gardnerville, maybe. They anyhow. And they ended up throwing 55 stitches into my head that Damn. night. Yeah, it was full on. And it was a pretty wild experience because 55 stitches is a lot. And they didn't really show me what it looked like after it got stitched up. They just bandaged me up and they had to remain like that for the next 10 days or so. And so for the next 10 days, you have no idea what you're going to look like when you take the bandage off. Oh, it's scary. It is super scary. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, at that point, I was just thankful that I didn't lose an eye. I didn't lose my nose. I didn't have worse of a concussion and that was still fully functioning, you know? So you really, you look for the wins in that kind of situation. And eventually the bandages came off and that doctor did such a great job, but he said he was, he was really lucky that, you know, most of the injury was around or through my eyebrow. And so he was able to use my eyebrow as a bit of a guide as to like how to put it all back together. Cause it just kind of uh, ruptured. And then the next one was filming with Matchstick, and I was hitting this kicker, or backcountry kicker, and I had kind of a, a sharp transition on the run out. Okay. And so I did this switch five, and I landed, and I was skiing out, but I was a little bit forward. And so when I hit that kink, I just bent forward <laughs> to the point where my face hit the tip of my ski. <laughs> and I had no idea that our tips are that sharp, and it just sliced my face open in three spots. Oh, shit. And then right away, I was bleeding like crazy. And I was so thankful uh, Riley Poor was there. He had a sat phone and made the call right away. 
And within 15 minutes, there was a heli picking me up and flew me back to the Whistler Hospital and stitched me up again. And there again, you know, I'm bandaged up for 10 days, not really knowing what I'm going to look like when I come out, because I think they put in 35 or 40 stitches that time. Oh, man. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And that put a pretty big scar on my forehead that's still visible to this day and across my nose and through my eyebrow again. And then after that, there were smaller incidents, but I had a drill fall on my head one time. <laughs> Dropped me like a sack of hammers. I was uh, assembling the geodome and I left a drill on top of the ladder like I do all too often and picked up the ladder. And it was this massive impact gun for fastening all the bolts to the geodome. So I think I got like another 10 stitches there. And then I had a bike accident where I went over the bars and put my face into a rock and I got a few more stitches there. So I'm up there, man. It's like around the 100 mark all in my face. (laughs) Yeah, man. I mean, I think Clayton Vila might be the only pro skier that has more stitches in his face from you. And his is from one incident. So that is gnarly. But at the same time, you're still a a pretty looking guy. So you've got that going for you. I know I say that, but whatever. (laughs) And when you're healthy, the most important part of what you do happens in Alaska. And you're a badass skier who has skied some serious lines in so many different places. But the first time you get there, is it intimidation or is it more excitement? It's always intimidation. You know, the idea of going there is exciting. But then when you get there, it's full intimidation. The mountains are, they're just steep. It's not like they're massive, but from ocean level to the top, yeah, they've got a a lot of vertical relief. And no matter how exciting the idea of skiing a spine line is, I think for most anyone, when you get to the top of it, you realize that the the consequences are are pretty full on. And if you crash, you're going to fall a long ways. So it's never easy. And yeah, I get sweaty palms just talking about it right now. (laughs) And no matter, you know, every time I go on those trips, sleep is a challenge. Like when you know it's going to be a bluebird day the next day. Oh, my goodness. Your mind is just racing at night with all the possibilities of the good and the bad that can happen, you know? So those days where you get incredible lines, people can watch that and know that you probably slept three hours the night before because you were so excited? 100%. Probably more scared than excited. And everybody's kind of like that? I think most people that I know experience that. Yeah, it's awesome. But I mean, we're usually going out the day after a storm which is why we ski spines so often. I mean, they're, they're fun to ski, but they're also, you know, one of the safer places to be on the mountain. Yeah. With losing your line or pockets pulling out, we're just kind of, <laughs> we're putting ourselves into the, these just full on situations at the same time. Then we're trying to, you know, huck big cliffs and then start hucking tricks off cliffs. And it's so hard up there because you never really know the scale of the line that you're going to get onto. So what you think could be a thousand foot line might be 2000 feet because there's there's no reference. Yeah. And so the cliff that you're looking at, your exit air, let's say, you might think is going to be a 50 footer, but it could be a hundred footer or it could be a 20 footer. And then for a long time, I was wanting to huck sevens off of natural features. And so you're like, am I going to do a 360 or a 1080 off that thing? Right. Yeah. So it's always, it takes a while just to kind of like settle in and know the size and the scale of where you are so that you can actually start kicking ass there and not just crashing. And thinking of kicking ass there, you've been there with some incredible crews. You've been to Alaska with Davenport, I think McConkie, Seth Pettit. (laughs) But off of what you know now, if you could pick three people to fill your helicopter, who would it be? Who's your all time AK crew? Oh, buddy, why you got to do that to me, man? I've never done it to anybody else. I figure I might as well do it to you. <laughs> oh, you know who I love skiing with so much is Carl Fosfed. That guy is incredible. Just fun guy and he pushes you and he's so creative. Oh, totally. In such a great way, man. Oh, I have so many great friends and you know, I would obviously I would lean towards like a Hoji and a Rubens type crew, but at the same time I would pull in on a Logan and a Sam Cooch and a Carl crew like I got to experience a couple of years ago. Oh man. Yeah. I couldn't pick a three man. <laughs> All right. We're gonna let you off that because we have time for more questions and they're gonna be more inappropriate than the last one that I just asked you because 
as you know from my last podcast, which we did just a couple days ago, we do inappropriate questions. And this week, I've got a guy who's going to be on the show in a couple months, a guy that you like so much that you drank his piss and you didn't puke. I'm talking about (laughs) Josh Duick. And Josh came up with three questions. Are you ready for question number one from Josh? Oh, man, he's probably the most inappropriate person I know. Yeah, give everybody. All right, here we go. What is the worst thing that you've ever had to eat or the worst thing that you've had to do in order to get a meal? Oh now, remember gosh. that we used to make you do some pretty awful things in order to get food because you were such a broke-ass ski bum back in the day. We weren't really nice <laughs> yeah. to you. So it's so the worst thing that you've ever had to eat or do in order to get a meal. You were that poor that people would buy you food but make you do stuff for it first? No, they were never purchasing food. It was like finding food. <laughs> okay. And then creating these gnarly concoctions. And then it, it would kind of like – begin this bidding as to people daring me to actually eat whatever it was at that time. So it's a long list of items, but I mean, there was times when I didn't have enough cash for catching a bus or putting food on my table or in my belly rather. <laughs> I didn't always have a table. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I would just eat and drink whatever it was to make a quick 20 bucks or a hundred bucks sometimes. So wide range of things, but I remember eating like the nacho cheese paper that comes on the plate. <laughs> Just the One paper. <laughs> Just the paper. <laughs> it's probably still in my digestive tract at this point. That's uh, funny. Um, I've eaten a June bug that was found in an oil reservoir. <laughs> that was super gnarly. Those <laughs> bugs, they're quite substantial and crunchy and nasty. I've had people just put together the, like the gnarliest concoctions from condiments and whatnot in the fridge, throw it into a blender. Man, that not having a sense of smell, which affects your taste, totally really helps. helps you out. Yeah, <laughs> for sure it does. Yeah, and I think it actually that was a part of one of my segments one year was I was dared to eat all these, what was it, like tuna salads or something? I ate like 20 tuna salads in five minutes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was always a thing you know people like i dare you to eat this 20 bucks i'm like yeah it's quick 20 bucks for sure i'll do it i would do that too for 20 bucks yeah and i was blessed with no sense of smelling and iron guts so it kind of made it rather easy for me <laughs> nice all right we'll jump into question number two you are not a kiss and tell guy at least to my knowledge so i want to know where is the wildest place that you've ever had sex? All right. (laughs) I don't ask that question or ever ask anybody those questions, but Josh does. Oh, that is hilarious. Well, I'm I'm definitely an outdoors kind of guy. I mean, has there been a ski lift, a porta potty? A porta potty? No. Okay, good, good. (laughs) Ski lift, yes. Okay. On a snowmobile, yes. On a paddleboard? Paddleboard, yes, yep. Um, kind of like anywhere where it's possible, more or less. And if it's in the outdoors, even better. But yeah, to try to find one wild experience. Or just one weird, unique place. Yeah, give me a moment on that. You might have to... Um... <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of pulling a blank. Maybe I just have that much sex that not one place is that unique. I mean, that's, that's, I can't even believe you just said that. That's like, <laughs> yeah, I dream of, of having to be able to say that someday. We're going to go to question number three after that comment. All right. Here we go. Last but not least, I want to know, because you probably are one of the toughest human beings with the highest pain thresholds that I've ever met. What is the most uncomfortable you've ever been? And the challenge for you is to answer that in a non-mountain environment. So... What's the most uncomfortable you've ever been while in regular life, if you will? And if you have to, go into mountain life because that's cool too. There we go. <laughs> the most painful. You know, to be honest, man, post-knee surgery. Just being locked straight and having to break scar tissue? Oh, break scar tissue. And for my surgeries, they use my hamstring. Oh, that sucks. Oh, my gosh. Like not even the knee portion is that bad. It's the healing of the hamstring. And it's when you accidentally trip or just catch your toe on something and you re-tear that hamstring muscle. 
It's leveling, man. Because <laughs> that's what another three months of getting your hamstring back? Uh, it's not that bad. I think it feels worse than it actually is. And that's something that I really didn't understand because people are always getting knee surgeries. And I was definitely the kind of guy where I tried to go without pain meds. Yep. And oh my gosh, that was so, so challenging. The first couple of weeks, the first week, especially, you know, just trying to go to the bathroom was so excruciatingly painful. And is that hurting your hamstring more than anything? Because I had a patellograph, so I didn't have to deal with the hamstring at all. But it sounds like the hamstring was the big issue there. Yeah, totally. And it's, it's so close to the area of the knee. And so sometimes I didn't know if I had retorn my ACL or if it was just my hamstring kind of going through its healing process. So it's all messing with your head too? Oh, totally. Yeah. So that was the biggest challenge because it happened back to back for me and I couldn't really get prepared for that again. <laughs> and it was back to back two different legs, right? Yep, exactly. Thankfully, they both happened in the spring. So I was still able to get a bulk of my season in. And then I was still in a good enough time where I was able to get into surgery early enough that I was back on skis in November again. So I was super lucky. And I'm sure you're just an absolute animal when it comes to rehab. So I could see you on skis early. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, actually. It was the time when I definitely got into like arguably the best shape of my life because that's all I had to focus on was getting my knee back in shape. But with that, I also got my body into really good shape because I was at the gym or at the physio so often. And it was during that time where I wouldn't drink at all because it just causes inflammation. And then I would start eating anti-inflammatory foods. And that's, I think, largely what kind of got me onto learning more about eating well, because I had to, to get back on snow again. I mean, it's your job, man. You have to do whatever you possibly can to get yourself in the best shape you can to be on snow. So yeah, every aspect totally. that you can to get yourself better is what you need to do. Yeah. And at this point, that's the end of the podcast, man. I want to thank you for your time last week. I want to thank you for your time this week. I want to thank you for all just the amazing segments that you've put together over the years, because anytime that there's a movie with an ABMA segment, it's usually the highlight of a lot of people's years, mine included. I just love watching you ski and just the power that you bring to the table and you always have. And I thank you for your time and look forward to what you're putting out in the next year or so. Yeah, thanks so much, man. It was re really, really great to catch up. Hopefully we can uh, catch up on snow one of these days. So that was part two with Mark Abma, and what a way to kick off season six. While most of us look at Abma as a strong, powerful skier, after talking to him for a few hours, it's like that's only 20% of the dude. And it was so cool to hear the other things that make Abma tick. And while we'll continue to see Abma crushing it on snow, I feel like his side projects are going to give him just as much to talk about when we do another podcast in the future. So that was time with another living legend, Mark Abma. Now it's time for the review of the week, and it comes from SMS Visuse, and it's a five-star review titled Best Part of a Monday. Here's the review. The Powell movement is a huge boost for me to attack the week harder and harder. Mike has an incredible ability to break down barriers with his guests and create an organic and interesting conversation. As a graphic designer for Wagner Custom, this is a great way for me to gain more insight into the ski industry, along with other action sports, and keep me motivated. My favorite part, however, is hearing about what happened to my heroes, such as Evan Raps, after they disappeared from view. Thank you for all this content, Mike, and keep up the great work. Well, thank you for that review, SMS. One of my goals is to provide everyone with a little more insight into the industry, and since you're part of this industry, and you're getting as much as a listener who's not on the inside, that's really cool to me. All I ask of you is to please try and sneak my logo into any products that you're designing. And if you need to see what my logo looks like, well, email me at mikeatthepowellmovement.com with your address, and I'm going to send you a custom Powell Movement beanie with that logo. For anyone else that wants a custom Powell Movement beanie, you can buy one on my site or post a review, and if I read it on the show, I'll send you one. And this review, it can be anywhere on social media or on iTunes. Just please make sure you tag me so I'm aware of what you posted. Thanks for that, and thanks everyone for listening. And finally, please support my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Elon Skis, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Alpine Vans, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.